um, inviting me today. Um, I know that you all probably had many other things that you could be doing with your time right now. So the fact that you are using your time to you know, join us in this conversation and increase our understandings of, of other faiths is, is really, really wonderful. And I love you know, being at home and my children see me preparing for these presentations and they ask me, well, where are you going, Mom? <laughs> you know, and, and sometimes it's you know, going to school, sometimes it's coming to other houses of worship or you know, presenting to different audiences. Different and I think it's just so important that I try to instill in my children the importance of um, reaching out to, to members of the community. I mean, we're, we're all one community, and, and I really do acknowledge and recognize the, the value and the blessings in, in having these relationships. So thank you for being here. This is wonderful. And Rosanna has some papers she's holding up. I forgot to give you these. I'm sorry. These are the... Oh, wonderful! Because this will be a lot easier for me to read than trying to look at the screen. This is <laughs> so great. Should I? Can I go ahead and pass them out? Yes. Okay. Maybe I'll send some this way and then some the other way. Go and pass them that way. Yeah, this will be a lot easier because I don't know how the mouse will help you with getting how clear it will be on the screen. Yeah, you have to okay. go in. Would you like me to operate that for you? Uh, th yeah, that would be great, Rosanna. And I'll go down to just one laptop instead of two. That would be great. <laughs> so I will start with greeting you with the greetings of peace, which is assalamu alaikum. And as I said, it's, it's really an honor to be here to spend some time discussing with you one of my great role models, Mary Maryam, the mother of Jesus. And in presenting a presentation like this, a topic like this, I, I feel the responsibility of it, right? So I have to do my part to prepare because I'm not an imam, I'm not a, a scholarly person, um, but I want to make sure that I'm doing my part to, to relay um, the best information and knowledge that I can to you. So I do feel that responsibility. And it, it's so wonderful to see uh, you know, people of different faiths and, and to be able to have these discussions. And it's important for us to look at the qualities that we can take from our history and from past devoted women of our history and these qualities that we can hopefully embody ourselves and relay to our children and impart these, these messages and these qualities to our children as well. And we're talking about Mary, the mother of Jesus, who is obviously a female, but it's very important for, you know, I have boys as well, right? So this, these aren't just lessons for women, these are lessons for all of mankind, men and women, and Mary was a, a role model for men and women. So looking at the life of Mary, one of the things that is kind of remarkable is how often she is mentioned in the Quran. She is mentioned more times than her son, Jesus, in the Quran, which is a very important point. And many times we hear that common saying of, um, behind every great man is a great woman. Sure. <laughs> and usually this applies to, or you know, if the assumption is um, it's attributed to his wife, right? But what about the mother? What about the greatness of a mother? And so we know that Mary was, she was a great woman, a beautiful woman, a confident woman, a devout woman, and, and, that, and the tradition of Islam, her greatness is not necessarily tied to her son. And in the Islamic tradition, um, Islam says in the Quran that Mary was the greatest woman to walk on earth. And the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, in one of his sayings, one of his hadiths, is that she was the greatest woman of her time. So, and we'll, we'll go through this in the presentation today Well, you'll you'll be able to see the, the importance of Mary and the lessons we can learn from her. So I have a short presentation for you today, and I'm gonna to try to, oh, this is wonderful, Rosanna. <laughs> I just turned around, I'm like, oh, now I can read it from the screen. So the presentation today, it's, it's taking um, different verses from the Quran, and I'm going to present to you in the form of a story. And we're gonna use these verses from the Quran to tell the story of Mary. And the Qur'an is divided into chapters, and one of the chapters in the Qur'an is titled Maryam. So there's an entire chapter in the Qur'an that is dedicated to the story of Mary. So what makes 
Miriam, or Mary, so special. And God says that she is an example for all of those who believe. Not just for the believing woman, but for all of those who believe. So God gives us an example for those who believe. The wife of Pharaoh, when she said, My Lord, build for me a home near you in paradise, and save me from Pharaoh and his deeds, and save me from the wrongdoing people. Mary, the daughter of Amran, who guarded her chastity, so we blew the spirit of Jesus into her through our angel Gabriel, and she believed in the words of her Lord and his scriptures, and she was she was of the devout ones. So you should, um, is that, oh yeah, there it is. Okay, I'm just making sure it's on the sheet there for you as well. So it's interesting, if you look through the verses in the Quran where Mary is mentioned, she is not most of the time, she is not associated in every verse with her son. So when God speaks of Mary, he's speaking of her and not necessarily her connection with her son. More times than that, she is associated with her father. And it states in the Quran, Maryam, the daughter of Imran. So more times her, her association was with her father than with her child. And this shows that her, her greatness is not necessarily tied to her connection with her son and her son alone. And we know, of course, that we know the, the importance of her son, Jesus being a prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, and the relevance and the significance of prophet Jesus. But even with that, Mary's character stands alone even from that, because she had such great conviction, devotion, um, courage, and trust in God, and a strong relationship with God. So we know that Mary's name, as I said, was mentioned more times in the Quran than her son's name, Jesus. So we know her, her recognition is not necessarily tied to the recognition of her son. She is a woman that demonstrates the quality of trust in the most difficult times, and these are things that we'll get to when we go through her story. She is an example of modesty and devotion, and she excels in all of these virtuous qualities. And if you look at the, um, the, the Greek copy of the New Testament, Mary's name is, is written 19 times, whereas in the Quran, uh, Maryam's name is mentioned 34 times. So Mary is someone that I can relate to, not just because of her son, like we said, but because of who she was and what I can strive to be. So she can be a role model for anyone. So we'll start with her birth. And now we're going to check the technology here to see if I'm, if we can go to the next slide. Yeah, sit there. So, yeah. No, no, there's another one. Okay, there we go. Oh, was it there? Yes. Okay. Did you change it already? <laughs> Something's going on behind me. I'm not seeing everything, but okay. Rosanna so okay. knows what she's doing, and I really okay. shouldn't question it. <laughs> Okay, so the, the story of Mary that we're going to look at, we're going to look at um, her birth, kind of the time before she was born, then her life as a child, and then um, her pregnancy and her um, birth of Prophet Jesus. So those are kind of the three main times in her life that we're going to look at. So her birth is a story that begins with devotion, that begins with her mother and her father. She was dedicated to God before she was even born. And her mother's name was Hannah, and her father's name was Amran. And Amran was the leader of his people in his community. And Hannah and Amran were very loved and very respected by the people of the community. They loved them. And they didn't have any children. And as Amran became um, older, um, people, you know, nobody really expected them to have children. It wasn't, you know, anything that they um, thought that he's older now, you know, they're not going to have children. So. When Hannah was given the news from God that she was pregnant, they were elated. Um, Hannah praised and thanked God. Her husband, Amran, praised and thanked God. And the community was just so excited that this was a couple that they loved and respected so much. And then, and then um, tragedy happens. And the tragedy that happens is that Amran suddenly um, passes away and he dies of an unexpected sudden death. So now here we have Hannah who is pregnant and she's going to deliver a, a baby without a father because her husband unexpectedly died. And she, she, she doesn't know if she's pregnant with a boy or with a girl, but 
she's, they're very God conscious people, and she made a promise to God that my child will be devoted to you, devoted to worshiping you and devoted to serving you. And, and at that time, men and boys um, were the ones that were devoted to the temple. They were the ones that would worship in the temple. And so in Hannah's mind, she's thinking, I'm, I'm, I'm making a promise with God that I'm gonna devote my child to the temple, to the worship of God. And so in her mind, she's expecting that she's going to have a son. But of course, God just gives her news that you're pregnant. He, he doesn't tell her if you're going to have a boy or, or a girl, or a prophet, or a layman, or anything. Just that she's pregnant. So then, um, Hannah delivers her baby, and it is a girl. And she says, oh Allah, I gave birth to a girl. And God replies to her that, I, I know. I, I, I'm all-knowing. <laughs> this was an accident. I, I know that you had a girl. And she replies, she says, God, a boy is not like a girl. And what she meant by that was, how am I going to devote my daughter to your worship, knowing that at the time, it just didn't happen. Girls weren't devoted to um, worship in the temple. That was something that was um, exclusive for the men and the boys. And so in her mind, she said, but, but a boy is not like a girl. And then she goes on to say, but I named her Maryam, and I seek refuge for her and for her offspring from the accursed devil. And she makes a prayer, essentially, for Mary and for Mary's offspring, who we know who Mary's offspring is. It's the beloved prophet Jesus. So at this time, even before Mary, um, you know, before we know the rest of her, her, her story and her significance, her mom is making a prayer, Hannah, for her daughter and for her daughter's offspring. I'm afraid to, I don't know if I look at there. Okay. Yes, we're at. Um, okay, so here we see the verses. Oh my Lord, I have vowed to you what is in my womb to be dedicated to your service. So accept this from me. Then when she delivered her, Mary, she said, Oh my Lord, I have delivered a female. And God knew best what she delivered. And she replies, And the male is not like a female. And I have named her Mary, and I seek refuge with you for her and for her children from Satan. So now we are at um, her childhood. And here it says, that, Oh Mary, indeed God has chosen you, purified you, and chosen you above the woman of the world. And it's interesting to notice, just in this verse, how God says twice, that she was chosen. It doesn't say it just once, so there's, there's wisdom in that, that twice it is repeated that you were chosen. O oh Mary, be devoutly obedient to your Lord and prostrate and bow down along those who, down, who, who bow in prayer. Um, so Hannah delivers Miriam, and she wasn't quite sure what to do with her because, and, you know, again, she had the mindset that she was having a boy and, and she had made a promise to God and it wasn't practical for women at that time to devote, to devote themselves to the temple because that just didn't happen at the time. So at this time, one of their kinfolk, his name was Zachariah, or Zachariah. He, was, he was a very devout man, an older man, and he was also very devout, had a close relationship with God, and he was a carpenter. So he took it upon himself to build um, for Mary a place within the temple where she could have her privacy maintain her modesty, and still be allowed to devote herself to the worship of God. And in Arabic, in the Quran, this, this place or room that he built for her within the temple is referred to as a mihrab. And the root word for mihrab comes from the Arabic word of haraba. And that word literally translates to to wage war, which doesn't quite fit with being in a house of worship and waging war, right? But how do those go together? So that comes from the concept of waging war against yourself, against your lowest desires, against your own personal vices, and, and contemplating in that house of worship, what can I do to become a better person? And inherently, we have these vices, these internal vices, and so this is a, a place of contemplation, a place of um, remembering God and, and 
trying to purify oneself internally and waging that internal war. So he, he builds this room for her to worship there. Okay, oh, they're there already. And this young girl, because Maryam was very young at this time, and she loved to worship God. She loved to worship God. And even when she wasn't at the temple, if she was outside, she spent a lot of her time in the temple worshiping and devoting herself to God. But even when she was outside of the temple, everything she did was about the remembrance of God and, and glorifying God and, and recognizing his majesty. So she would eat, drink, sleep. Everything she did was, was in the remembrance of God. And so sometimes she would stay in her mihrab, in the temple, for days at a time. And Zechariah kind of took it upon himself to check on her every once in a while to make sure that she was okay. And one day, he went to visit her in this chamber, in this mihrab, and there was food in her room. And this was fruit that was out of season. And there was no refrigeration, you know, concept of refrigeration at this time. And so Zechariah asks her, he says, he says, um, who is giving this to you? Where, where is this from? And she replies, this is from God. And Allah gives to whomever, who, to whomever he wills whenever God wants. And this is, an, this is interesting because this is an understanding. This shows that Maryam, at even such a young age, had an understanding of supplication and prayer and asking upon God calling upon God and asking God for, for her needs and, um, and, and telling God and having that communication and that relationship. And she doesn't say to him, her response is, is really has wisdom in it because she doesn't say to him, so, so, you know, clearly I have this great relationship with God, so if you need something, just ask me and I'll, I'll make the prayer for you. You know, and he doesn't tell her, well, hey, Mary, can you make this prayer for me? Can you ask God to give me this and this? No, she told him, you should call upon God, and you should, you know, seek what you need. And so he, he takes this advice, these words of wisdom, and he, he um, didn't have children at the time, so he went immediately and made supplication to have a child. And then he received a child. So this was just a, a, a little bit of a, a lesson for Zechariah. He was a, a devout man. He was very close to God, and he spent a lot of his time in worship. And here you have young Mary teaching him something about um, trusting and calling upon God. And this shows that she had true conviction in what she believed. She knew that if she prayed to God, then God would answer her prayer. So at one point, I love how we're in sync here, Rosanna. <laughs> so um, at one point, Mary leaves the mihrab, and she goes someplace to the east and is met by a beautiful human being. And in the Quran, this, this man that meets her is referred to as Basharan Samia, and that literally means um, that has, has good symmetry. And we know that beauty is, is tied to symmetry. So she, she doesn't have much interaction with men, right? Because her time is devoted to worshiping in the temple. So in her modesty, she, she's you know, approached by this man that she doesn't know. He's a beautiful man. She's a young woman. She's alone. And she doesn't know what his intentions are. She doesn't know if he's there to take advantage of her or what his intentions are. So her immediate response to him is, you know, she doesn't flirt with him, right? She's a, a young girl with a, a, a good-looking guy in front of her, but she doesn't flirt with him. She has a lot of modesty. Instead, she says, Verily, I seek refuge with the most gracious from you, if you do fear God. And what this shows is that, first of all, this shows that she's not interested in Right? So immediately she's giving him the clear message that I'm not interested. Then there's, there's some wisdom in the fact that she mentions Ar-Rahman. And Ar-Rahman is one of God's names or attributes that means the merciful one. So because she wants him to know that if you have bad intentions or ill intentions, that you can seek forgiveness from the merciful one. And, 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 um, I'm reminding you that you need to fear your Lord and that your Lord is merciful. 
And so when she said those words to him, when she said those words to him, I indeed, I seek refuge with the most merciful from you if you do fear God. Then um, the, the man changed form and revealed himself as being the angel Gabriel. And his response to her was, I am only the messenger of your Lord to give you the news of a pure boy. She said, how can I have a son when no man has touched me? He said, so your Lord said, it is easy for me, and we will make him a sign to people and a mercy from us. And it is a matter already decided. So he reveals himself. And so it's interesting to note that the angel Gabriel approached her initially at, in the human form, in the form of a man. And if you look at the Islamic tradition, um, there are many times when the angel Gabriel comes to different prophets and Prophet Muhammad and Mary in the form of a man rather than in their authentic form of angels. And this is to be less intimidating because we know in one of the um, times that the angel Gabriel visited Prophet Muhammad in his original form, in his authentic form, um, Prophet Muhammad describes him as his vastness filling up the horizon. So it's, it's quite, you know, it's not the, the, um, the image of what m one might think of an angel. And I don't quite know how all other faith traditions um, see angels. But sometimes they're depicted with like a halo or that they might have feathers as wings. And so in Islam, we know that the, the form of an angel can be quite um, intense, filling up the horizon. So this is how Angel Gabriel first approached her as a man and then revealed himself as the angel. And, and he gives her news that you are pregnant and you are pregnant with a son named Jesus. And she says, and he blew into her and she is pregnant with Jesus. And she said, but how can I have a child? No man has touched me. He said, it's a closed case. It's already done, right? You're, you're already pregnant. And so keep in mind, here she is, this young, we believe 16 year old girl at the time. And she's by herself um, in a society at a time when any kind of hint of adultery or fornication would mean that you could be stoned to death, you could be driven out um, and alone. So she goes into hiding for the remainder of her pregnancy. And then it comes time for her to deliver her son. And she feels the pains of labor, but she's more concerned about how am I going to take this child back to my people and how am I going to explain this? And so she says, I wish I was dead. This, this was difficult for her. This was really difficult for her. And, and if any of you know, uh, if, anybody, if anybody's been through um, childbirth, you know the pains of childbirth. And I mean, we could, you know, break somebody's hand if we're squeezing it, right? It's, it's very difficult. And so here she is, this young girl, alone, and, and, and delivering her baby. So she says, would that I had died before this and had been forgotten and out of sight. So the, the pains of childbirth drove her to the trunk of a date palm. And she said, as we said, I wish that I, I, I would die. And then her Lord <coughs> cried to her, um, said to her, grieve not. And she is instructed to shake the trunk of the date palm and ripe dates will fall upon you. And if you see any human being say, verily I have vowed a fast for the most gracious, so I shall not speak to any human being for today. That if anybody asks you about your child, don't speak. So I just, I want to point out that um, she is told to shake the date palm tree. And so this is not, if you've seen a date palm tree or if you have an idea what it's like, it's, it's, a, it's a tree with a firm trunk, right? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, at, when I was a child reading this, when I was younger, because uh, of course as you get older your concept and frame of reference changes, right? So you can't just shake a date palm tree and have the dates fall, right? So this is part of the miracle um, of the birth of Jesus as well, is that she was able to shake this tree, and we know that after delivering a child, um, the mother is weak and needs that nutrition, and so she was able to shake the date palm tree, and she did indeed get um, the dates to receive some nutrition. And it says in the Quran, God says, 
that she is amongst the most devout men and women and to shake the date palm tree. And it's a sign from her Lord that she has to trust her Lord. And she understands this concept of trust. She's a woman of devotion and she knows that her Lord will take care of her. So she doesn't quite know what's gonna happen, but she knows that she has confidence and trust. And God tells her, don't defend yourself, that I'm, God will defend you, right? So people speak to you and they question you, don't worry, I'm, I'm gonna take care of this, I'm gonna defend you. So she knew God was with her. So she went back to her people, right? This shows her confidence and her courage and really her trust in God, that she didn't wait for her people to come looking for her. She took her baby and she went back to her people. And all these years of worship and devotion that she had gone to leading up to this had prepared her for this moment, had prepared her to have such trust in God. So when she goes back to her people, they start questioning her. And they say, um, they say that you, you have really brought a thing. What, what is this child? You know, where did you get this child from? And they say, you are the sister of Harun, Aaron, and you are the daughter of Imran. And your parents were not like this. Your parents were devout people. So they're kind of telling her, remember who you are. Remember where you came from. How, you know, you're not the type of person to do this. And so she's kind of being interrogated at this moment. So you would think um, naturally somebody would want to defend themselves. But she remains silent. She remains silent as God instructed her to do, and she points to her baby. And when she points to her baby, he starts to speak, and he starts to defend her. And she hadn't heard him speak beforehand, so this was a surprise to her as well. And her baby defended her. He said, um, I am a servant of Allah. He has given me the scripture and made me a prophet and he has made me blessed wherever I be. And then he goes on to say, and to be dutiful to my mother and made me not arrogant. And peace be upon me the day I was born and the day I die and the day I shall be raised alive. So not only is he telling people who he is, that he's a prophet, he's also telling people about his mother, that I'm dutiful to my mother, that I'm devoted to my mother. So if we look, that's kind of the, the end of her, um, the story of Mary. She continues to be in the life of the prophet Jesus, of course, but really her, her um, the, the, the story where she's mentioned in the Quran, this is really up to the point where um, she's kind of highlighted. And we can see through these stories that Mary has qualities of being devout, of being confident in the decree of her Lord, and upholding principles of modesty, and knowing that with the connection to your Lord, the possibilities are endless. And this shows her courage, her, her confidence, and her relationship with her Lord. So she is an example for all men and women, and, and um, an example of how to maintain our trust in God, even through difficult times. So that's, that's the end of the presentation, and I ask God to make us all devote um, devout in his worship and to maintain our, our relationship and to put our trust in God. Um, I, I guess I will take some questions. I will do my... Before we oh, do that, we have something else. Yes, Sorry. We, we have some verses uh, of the Quran that uh, Rania just talked about. We will be sharing them on uh, on a slideshow so you can read and, and hear it as it's coming out. We hope technology will help do that. Yes, it's working. <coughs> we have sound? <laughs>